Thank you, David. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, present our work about uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, actually, it's partly done work and partly work in progress. You will see our presentation today because uh, Scott and I, we have uh, much worked about the French case and what we will present to you in the first part of the presentation today is based on the case of France uh, on which we have published several papers and we, will, uh, we are uh, finishing a book. Uh, and then we will open on other countries on which we are working, which is much more work in progress. So uh, we will be very interested by your insight, uh, especially uh, about the comparison part. So we'll speak about uh, state-owned enterprises. Um, <clears throat> what is a state-owned enterprise? Actually, it could appear as something quite obvious. State-owned enterprise uh, is an enterprise which is owned by the state. OK. But actually, um, this definition is not very precise, very clear, uh, because if we take what uh, law specialists say or some economists, uh, state-owned enterprise is an enterprise in which the state owns more than 50% of the shares. So it's an on-off situation. You are or you are not a state-owned enterprise. Actually. The reality is much more blurred and what much more complicated because um, when we look uh, at state capitalism, uh, we see situation in which state owns all the shares of a company and of even sometimes it's not really a company, it's only a, it's an administration doing some uh, industrial work, for instance. And in some other cases, you have state which owns only 5%, 10% of a firm or of a group of firms and so on. So we have a very wide um, um, amount of situations and very different one uh, from the other. So we are speaking about state-owned enterprise with a very wide vision of what could be a state-owned enterprise. And uh, we are much more speaking about state capitalism in its different forms. Uh, it can take sometimes through holdings, sometimes directly uh, um, owning uh, some, uh, uh, some society some firms. Uh, you have a variety of operators. If you look from one country to, to another, in some countries, uh, state-owned enterprises are directly controlled by the Ministry of Finance of the country. And in some other countries, you have uh, some uh, national banks which are owned by the state, who, which themselves own some industrial companies, for instance, or uh, national holdings and so on. For instance, in China, the system of state-owned companies is much uh, um, goes much through uh, state holdings, state banks, and so on. And you have many some many kinds of mixed systems uh, in France, for instance. But not only. We will see that later. Why speaking of state-owned enterprises? Actually, when we began to work, when we began working about state-owned enterprises, maybe ten years ago, Scott and I, we were in a way, working on something which was quite old-fashioned. You know, it was some relics of the past. We, are, we have still many state-owned enterprises in France, but the trend was on privatizations. So the idea was that these state-owned enterprises, they will last some time and they will disappear at some point. Uh, and it's some kind of French peculiarity, you know, French. The state is strong in France, so you have state-owned enterprises. OK. Actually, the problem is that uh, in, during the last 10 last years, the share of state-owned enterprises in the global GDP has been rising uh, for different reasons. Uh, first, uh, because of the growth of emerging countries in which state-owned enterprises are very strong, especially China, but also Brazil, for instance. Uh, <clears throat> that's the first point. The second point is that you have the emergence of uh, sovereign funds, uh, which have begun to be very strong in the world economy, in the world finance, uh, for instance, uh, in Saudi Arabia and uh, 
Arab countries, but also Norway and so on. And also you have the fact that in the developed countries in which the trend since the 1980s to uh, the beginning of the 2010s was on uh, privatization, the trend began to change and uh, there were some, ca some new, national new nationalizations, especially after the uh, two uh, 2008 uh, uh, crisis. Um, and the trend is now much more on new nationalizations than or on more privatizations. Uh, <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, in France, for instance, the trend of privatization stopped at the end at around 2010 and now you have some kind of new shares which are uh, taken by the state and when the state tries to uh, sell uh, shares in some firms most of the time you have some of the times you have some strong oppositions of uh, unions and sometimes of the population just before the covid crisis there, were, there was a strong uh, um, um, conflict in France ar around the privatization of uh, airport of Paris airport, ADP, Aéroport de Paris, uh, in which uh, there was a strong coalition of opposition against uh, this privatization. So you have a growing share of uh, uh, state-owned enterprises in the global GDP uh, and moreover the issue of state capitalism is a quite tricky one because uh, the, the place of uh, state-owned enterprises in capitalism is something which is quite abnormal because if we follow the liberal credo, liberal creed, we should have only private firms dealing with uh, and industry, uh, finance and so on, and the state should be only reduced to uh, uh, regulating firms. So this kind of firm which has which are both pri part of the market system and part of the, st of the state system are s often seen in, in orthodox economics as, as an abnormal thing. It should not happen. At sometimes it happens but it should not happen. But actually it raises many very interesting questions about the links between states and markets about what is the boundary between, between private and public. Uh, and as we see, uh, there are uh, different importance between capitalism. Of course, in the US, there are very few state-owned enterprises, nearly known. But in European capitalism and in emerging capitalism, you have many of them. And on, uh, we will uh, see that later. Um, what is interesting is seeing that you have uh, <coughs> different kind of regulations about the, state, the question of state-owned enterprises because if you take the uh, competition uh, system in the European Union, for instance, you have um, a very strange situation in which the European Union says, okay, state can have state on enterprises. It's okay. We are okay with that. It's not our problem as European Commission. But at the same time, it should not affect uh, competition between firms. And you all immediately see that there is some kind of problem because when you have a state-owned enterprise, most of, of, of the time it's on some kind of part monopoly or something like that. So the question of um, ideology and the question of regulation system uh, is uh, quite important and as a matter of fact the, the OECD produces guidelines about how should be governed uh, state-owned enterprises. So <clears throat> state-owned enterprises are big stuff and <coughs> What we see when we look at the literature in political economy about state-owned enterprises, 
there are some kind of problems. The first one is that set on enterprises are very rarely taken as an object per se. Sometimes it is, but most of, most of the time it's only taken as a symbol, as a symbol of something else, which is the global intervention of the state in the economy. So in some of uh, the major political economy uh, reviews about the difference between uh, state capitalism and different countries, the equation is quite simple is you have more state on, on, on enterprises, you have a stronger intervention of the state in the economy, you have lower, uh, a lower amount of state on enterprises, you have a lower intervention of the state in the economy. And that's all. Uh, and for instance, in the French case, uh, state on enterprises are often taken as um, an element of what is called by the international literature as French dirigisme. Dirigisme is a French word, dirigisme, which is taken in the American literature and English-speaking um, English literature to uh, describe the French case and the French uh, uh, organization of the economy. And most of the time you say, well, you, you have many SOEs in France and that's a proof that you have a strong dirigism in France and that's all. You have also in the orthodox economics a big literature about the efficacy of state-owned enterprises. Spoiler, most of the time they say it's not efficient, okay. Uh, <coughs> And also about uh, the question of the mixing worlds of the state and the, the idea that when you have a state-owned enterprise, it, you don't know what the state is really. Is it a shareholder? Is it a client? Is it a regulator? And so on. So this, this different literature uh, <coughs> doesn't really look at how the firms are really controlled by the state. And what the state really do with this, what the states really do with these firms, and how the government of these firms change over time. Uh, <clears throat> what we choose to take is to take an historical approach. And as a matter of fact, the story, the history I have uh, recalled a bit, a bit uh, before, shows that you don't only have a one way trajectory, which is at some point you have many SOEs and after you privatize and it's over. No, as you see, you have some kind of uh, uh, changes and sometimes you have more privatization and sometimes more nationalizations. Uh, and uh, we try to look to the specific situation in, in each country in order to understand what are the links between the state and the uh, uh, SOEs and what it says about the transformations of uh, each national capitalism. So we take an institution, institutional and organizational approach. What does it mean? It's just uh, some kind of theoretical point in order to be clear with you because we are sociologists and not economists, so it changes a bit the way we uh, deal with uh, uh, issues. So uh, we um, analyze SOEs, uh, SOEs which is state-owned enterprises, we analyze SOEs uh, <coughs> from the point of view of the organizations and the individuals that really govern them. So we don't take SOEs as a general ID which is always the same and all the time the same. We look at who are the guys who really govern these firms. Are they, for instance, politicians? Are they civil servants? Are they uh, bankers? I don't know. We have some kind of difference between uh, situations. And what, is the, what are the organization? How the firms are organized? How the state is organized in order to deal with the firms and so on. So, and from this analysis of the organizations and the people who really govern these firms, we uh, try to uh, uh, compare the cases in order to see which are the common features between countries and which are the specific tra trajectories. 
More specifically, we will use a, a framework, a theoretical framework, which, which was uh, uh, proposed by uh, Neil Fickstein, uh, American sociologist in the 1990s, uh, which is the conception of control. Uh, <coughs> which is uh, based on the neo-institutional theor uh, theoretical fr framework. Uh, the central point of this uh, framework is to say that if you want to understand the strategy of firms, you don't always have to look at it as uh, an efficacy problem, an efficacy problem, but also as a legitimacy problem. Firms try to have strategies which are not only efficient, but also legitimate. And why is it important? It is important for several reasons, but including for economic reasons. It's important for economic reasons because when you are a firm, you have to deal with your environment, other firms, clients, uh, suppliers, banks, uh, state administrations, and so on. And these actors, have themselves conceptions about what is a good firm, a well-organized organized firm. So you have to comply with this conception, this do dominant conception at what moment of a time of what is a well-organized firm, what is a good strategy. So the strategy of firms is always constrained by this question of legitimacy. And a market, at some point of the history is characterized by some dominant conceptions of how should be a market organized, how should uh, be a firm organized. And so you have this uh, conceptual or uh, cultural dimension, uh, so which is linked with the question of diffusion, which is at some point, some dominant conceptions uh, will uh, diffuse uh, between uh, countries, between markets, and so on. And from this point of view, state-owned enterprise is an institutional form. At some point of history, if you read to uh, political economy uh, books of the 1950s, most of them say SOEs are very efficient. In the 1990s, most of them say SOEs are not efficient. So you see that you have some kind of uh, dominant conception that change over time. And uh, Neil Flickstein co or, uh, calls that a conception of control. So a conception of how the firm and the market should be controlled by, uh, uh, um, by firm and by managers. So a conception of control is a dominant conception of a uh, uh, you know, group of assumptions about competition, market, and organization, which are shared by a participant of a market, having in mind that participants of a market are not only firms, they are firms, their clients, their suppliers, their partners, and also the state, the state administration, and, and, and uh, banks, uh, and, and so on. Um, the idea behind that is that, of course, you have dominant actors that have the ability to impose to other their conception of how market should be organized, and which is most of the time associated with a dominant professional group. So to give an example, financialization of firms is linked with <coughs> <clears throat> the domination of some financial firms, but also to the dominance inside firms of financial actors. And it gives to uh, uh, the general market an idea of how uh, should firms be organized. So <clears throat> what we uh, argue is that um, we should not only look at the scope of SOEs, how much we have, but also have which kind of conception of control they uh, are uh, sharing. So we try to, govern, to characterize the government of SOEs according to different kinds of criteria, which is which, what is the purpose of SOE. 
it can be appear as, of, uh, as obvious, but it's not, is the uh, purpose of a SOE to uh, deliver profit for its shareholder, the state, or is it to give a product with a low price for client, uh, for clients, and, and so on. So you have uh, uh, um, what, are, what is supposed to be the, the policy of the firm towards its own employees, for instance, and so on. So what are, what is, uh, what are SOE supposed to do? Second point, of course, the question of capital. Uh, how do firms finance their activities? Which part of the capital is owned by the state? 100%, 100% 51%, 10%, it's not the same uh, conception. Um, does, does the firm ask to go to a financial market to get more, more, more capital? Does it have to uh, get some debt and so on? Third point, government and control, who are the actors really involved in the control of the firm, uh, which administrations in the state control SOEs. And uh, 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 fourth point, what is the structure of the market on which they operate? Uh, do they operate on uh, monopolies? Do they operate on national markets? Or do they operate on uh, global markets, do they operate on uh, regional markets, uh, on uh, 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 open uh, uh, competition market, and so on. The central point, we will argue, for, first uh, with the French case, is the fact that uh, the government of SOEs um, has been through a deep transformation uh, since the 1980s, uh, which we call uh, uh, what we call uh, normalization. Normalization is the idea that we'll see that the SOE should be governed like normal firms. Normal firms being private firms, private, well-managed firms. We'll see that later. So the normalization is a change of the organizational devices uh, in the, uh, organi in the um, working of organization, both in the state and in SOEs. It's also a change in the dominant representation of what should be SOEs on the market, the operator, and how, what they have to do with profitability, mm -hmm. and also with the professional characteristic of the individual in charge. We will see that. So first, we will speak about France. Of course, we are French and we have been working about France. Uh, and we have tried first to characterize the transformation in the French case. And as you will see, uh, we will try to apply this uh, uh, analysis to uh, other uh, European countries. So what we called the, normalizations, the normalization of French SOEs uh, <coughs> is an historical transformation of the representation and practices in the government of SOEs, as I said before. Um, the starting point we took is a post-World War II period. Actually, we'll, if we go a bit further in the, uh, the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century, uh, uh, we could give some other elements uh, on uh, how this uh, uh, public sector was uh, constituted and so on. But we begin with a starting point, which is how the French uh, SOEs are organized after the Second World War. And at that time, SOEs are seen as a tool of public policy. The central idea about SOEs in the state, <coughs> in the administration, uh, but also for the managers of these SOEs, is that they have to uh, conduct uh, uh, um, public policies uh, mainly in the building of facilities, uh, <coughs> public services, uh, electricity, the idea that electricity should be on the same price on the whole territory, both for uh, uh, personal clients, but also for enterprises in order to uh, promote the growth of the French uh, economy. Um, with the idea of uh, land use planning, you know, having the same price on all the territories, even if at some point it's very cheap, the production production is very cheap, and at other point uh, the production is much more uh, costly. 
Also, enforcing social policies uh, through the idea that uh, state-owned enterprises should be models of uh, uh, how uh, should, uh, we should deal with uh, trade unions and so on. Uh, and also, you have many sectorial policies specific. Um, we often think about uh, public services, you know, railways and electricity, but also but you have to bear in mind that many SOEs after the Second World War, they were not dealing with uh, uh, public services, but for instance, with uh, um, technological and defense issues, for instance, uh, developing weapons for the French army and so on. And uh, this idea was really the central point of the dominant conception of control of uh, SOEs after the Second World War. But as soon as the 1960s, you have uh, discontent inside the state apparatus and inside the firms about the question of profitability. Should this firm be profitable? Uh, and you have many discussions about that. You have a, a very important report of the French administration, which is called the Noha Report. Uh, in uh, 1967, which uh, uh, say that firms should be organized differently in order to, uh, state-owned companies should be organized differently in order to be more profitable. A very good example of that is the train, um, the train system, uh, which have been analyzed by our friend uh, Jean Finez about the question of uh, the price of the ticket. And he, he shows that the different evolution of the system of price of the ticket when you take a train in France uh, is linked to different conception of profitability. Uh, and um, the general idea that along the time you have a growing importance of profitability in the uh, ticketing strategy of uh, the SNCF, the French Railway Service. And one example of that, of that is uh, TGV, the high-speed train. When the high-speed train is developed in the 1970s, 1980s, it is really developed by the management of the SNCF with the idea that we will be able to make a train more expensive and to get more profit in order to uh, 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 have a better uh, uh, finance, uh, better finance for, for the firm. So you have a, a growing importance of the question of uh, profitability um, with some kind of, this, this trend is a bit uh, um, made more, more complicated by a specificity to French in the 1980s. You know, in the 1980s, it was a time when in most countries, most European countries, there was a beginning of privatization process. But in France, because of uh, um, the victory of uh, 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 socialist president uh, uh, François Mitterrand in 1981, you had a nationalization process in the 1980s of major banks, of uh, 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 major industries. What we show now is that the state actually uh, made the finance of this firm better than it was before. And most of the time it really made the dirty job for uh, private investors. Uh, because eight years later it began to privatize, five years later it began to privatize this firm. But the general trend is that the issue of profitability was uh, more and more important. And you had a reduction of the specificities of SOEs with the limitation of public service to part of the activity of firms. The idea with train, you have, when you take the train, if you, some of you have gone to Compiègne with the uh, regional train, it's very cheap. It's not really, it's not working very well, but it's very cheap. Uh, it's really subsidized by the region, by the state and so on. So it's very cheap. But when you go to, I don't know, Bordeaux or Strasbourg with a high speed train, it's very expensive. But it's working a bit better, but it's uh, much more expensive. So you have this kind of two-speed system, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, which began to be the organization of uh, the um, of uh, uh, SOEs. 
When you look on the organization and on the dominant conception of uh, SOEs in France since uh, 2005, something like that, you have the general idea that is SOEs should be normal firms. Um, the general discourse, when you listen to Bruno Le Maire, for instance, uh, the, the current uh, Minister of Economics, of uh, Economic Affairs, is that uh, SOE should not have many specificities. Private firms are, are seen to be able to fulfill the, the same objective in a more efficient way, um, with the idea that uh, making SOEs normal uh, is at the same time a way to uh, uh, convince institutional investors to invest in French firms and a way to convince uh, uh, the, general, the general audience about the change of the economics. And <coughs> you have uh, uh, an evolution of uh, um, the state which sees much and more itself as a shareholder. It can appear as quite obvious, but it's not actually saying that the state is a shareholder. In the 1960s, you had many, many state-owned enterprises in France, but the state did not define itself as a shareholder. You had state-owned firms, and that's it. The expression, the state as a shareholder, began to appear in, the, in French in around 2004, 2003. Three, and it was naturalized as an obvious expression to uh, uh, an obvious phrase to speak about the state. But the idea behind that is that the state should act as a shareholder towards firms that should act as normal firms. Um, and the idea that SOEs are not, are not special is also a way to say that they can be privatized at some point, or not, it depends, uh, because it's not always uh, uh, the case. Uh, and the model is some kind of a private company, but not uh, an actual private company. The idea that the upper administration think private company should be managed. And you see it's a bit different. It's uh, something that can change over time. Uh, but the idea is always the same that we should look like private firm, uh, but some kind of private firm, which is a big national firm. Uh, we will wait, yeah. Uh, yeah, it depends. Uh, for the biggest firms, if you take, I don't know, EDF, Electricité de France, it is a state, the state which owns. Um, but more, uh, a big part of state shareholding today goes through um, public operators like uh, Banque Publique d'Investissement, BPA France, uh, Caisse des Dépôts et Consignations, uh, which are uh, big state-owned banks, in a way, or investment actors, uh, which owns uh, many um, small firms, medium-sized firms, and so on. So you have different kinds of systems. And as I said before, in uh, other countries, you have cases in which it is directly the state, other to, uh, which uh, goes with, with uh, intermediary actors. So is it like the state is majority shareholder in something in a bank, let's say, and that bank is majority shareholder yeah. in something else? Yeah, but it's still state shareholding, even it's, if it's in, indirect shareholding. So. Um, so, the three points, I will go a, a bit quicker because I, I'm, I'm going a bit late. Um, the three central points of this uh, normalization is first a growing autonomy of uh, SOEs, 
with the idea that SOE should be organized as uh, groups uh, with subsidiaries um, with a mix of state and private capital. So in most SOEs now you have the state who owns part of the shares but not all the shares. Uh, so it should be governed like any other firm because you have a board of directors and so on and so on. Uh, Organized as, as international groups with headquarters and subsidiaries, um, which allows to uh, bypass, you know, the special status of, uh, of employees in France, for instance, in some cases, um, uh, and the contractualization of public services. And a major point of this autonomy is that when firms were, were seen as uh, um, tools of public policy, the state was, um, the, the dominant conception of the state was about sectors. You have the energy sector and you have to, deal, to have uh, an energy policy. Now it's not the point. You have energy firms, ADF, uh, NG, and they each have to get their own strategy. So you can have competition between your state-owned enterprises, which was, not absolute, which, was, which was absolutely not the case uh, before the period. So growing autonomy of SOEs vis-a-vis -vis the state and vis-a-vis -vis other companies uh, in the market. Also a financialization, to put it simply, the growing importance of shareholder value uh, in the governance of firms, um, the state uh, owned enterprises as financial assets with a growing importance of dividends. Small story, uh, EDF add to uh, borrow money on the financial market in order to give dividends to the state at some point because the state wanted to have more dividends in order to to deal with budget issues. Uh, so you have, this shows the, import, the, the central importance of uh, dividends as the issue of share price also, also. And the professionalization of chief financial officers. We made a study, we, we will not develop it today, but we made a study about the, the, the chief financial officers in the energy and defense industries. And we show that between the 1980s and the 2010s, you had a deep professionalization of the financial uh, activity in the firms and with uh, uh, international CFOs, uh, which are sometimes the vice president of firms. While at the beginning of the period, they were most of the time not even member of uh, uh, the uh, uh, executive committee. So you have a, a strong professionalization of, of CFOs. And the third point, autonom more autonomy, more financialization, and more internationalization of firms. So the idea was, is a shift from a national and protected market to an international and competitive market um, with uh, sometimes a quite a dual a strategy, you know, from in the 1990s, there was a strong policy of liberalization of markets in the European Union, and France was uh, one of the most reluctant countries because they wanted to protect their uh, firms, their, their SOEs. But in some times, the, these SOEs, which were protected in France, they profited from the liberalization in other countries. And EDF, for instance, Electricité de France, uh, began to buy many electricity firms in other European countries which had been privatized. So you have this dual system which was uh, uh, the basis for the development of uh, an international champions policy which is the idea that France, the st French state, should help its SOEs to become international champions in their markets. Um, through all the means possible, um, by international alliance, by merger and acquisitions, and uh, by investing in new markets, uh, uh, and, and so on. Um, 
On the state part, what is interesting is uh, that you have the creation in 1904, in 2004, of uh, a new agency, which is the uh, Agence des Participations de l'État, which is a uh, state uh, share, uh, shareholding uh, agency, um, which began to concentrate most of the control over SOEs. You know, in France, like in many countries, the dominant ministry in the administration is the Ministry of Finance. They get the money, so they control most of the thing. But in the post-Second World War system, you had some kind of balance between the Ministry of Economics and Finance and the, what was called the technical ministries, which are specialized of energy, defense, uh, industry, and so on. So you had some kind of balance of power between these administrations. Well, yeah. So a David question. Economics and finance were the same ministry or were they separate? Yeah, most of the time in France it's the same ministry. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you, you had other ministries which were controlling the uh, technical part. Um, and with the creation of the APE, you still have some technical specialization of other ministries, but most of the control is concentrated in uh, a small administration of the Ministry of Finance, which is the Agence de Participation de l'État, which has some kind of autonomy, uh, <clears throat> with the idea of professionalizing the state as a shareholder, because some of the uh, employees of the APE are not uh, civil servants. They are. They come from uh, uh, <coughs> finance, financial uh, firms, uh, from banks, and so on. Um, and this agency is really embodying the doctrine of the state as a shareholder. So you, you see, this transformation is not so only an abstract transformation. It's really uh, uh, built and dealt with by. Uh, uh, an organization, which is uh, the AP. So <coughs> it changes the policies of the states vis-à-vis uh, -vis the uh, SOEs. Um, in the case of EDF, as I said before, you have, for instance, increasing revenues uh, for the state. Um, and ED EDF uh, uh, changed from an industrial policy in instrument to a financial asset. Actually, it changed the, since, yeah, for the two last years, it changed because there is a strong change in the energy policy of the state and the idea that uh, France uh, should uh, invest in uh, nuclear energy uh, with uh, building new uh, reactors and so on for the uh, uh, energy transition and so on. So the state is uh, changing its policies, but just until uh, this moment, uh, uh, ADF was uh, uh, m uh, m more seen as an industrial poli uh, as a financial asset and not uh, an industrial in policy industrial policy instrument anymore. And the control shifted really from what was called the DGMP, so it was the Direction Générale pour l'énergie et les matières premières, which was part of the Ministry of Energy, and now the control is on the Ministry of Finance, which is a, a big shift in the uh, power relation inside the state. The state should not be seen as one behemoth. It's really a very complex organization of organizations uh, in which you have many uh, uh, struggles between administration and the, um, the struggles between the Ministry of Finance and the other ministry, uh, ministries are a major uh, uh, engine of the functioning of the state. And uh, since 2014, you even have what was called the dynamic portfolio management of the state, which is the idea that uh, uh, the state should uh, be able to sell shares at a good price, being a minority shareholder and not a majority shareholder, uh, deal with a financial actor. But at some point, we will see it's important in other cases, uh, save some endangered firms. So the idea that for the portfolio the state already control, we should be more dynamic. We should sell and buy and sell and buy when the price is high. And 
sometimes we should act uh, to save some national firms which are uh, endangered. So this process uh, I have uh, uh, briefly um, shown to you is, uh, yeah. The idea is that uh, it's, on, it's not an on-off system. You don't have, you are, uh, it's really the idea that uh, you should try to get the share you need to control the firm, but maybe it's for one firm it will be 15%, for the other one it will be 20 because the, uh, um, the structure of uh, the shareholding is not the same. So it, you, you will have to, uh, at some point, uh, if uh, the, 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 the firm will buy some other group, will merge with another group, it will change the, the share you have and you will maybe buy some in order to keep control. Or This is, this is the idea of... of, uh, of uh, um, but the idea is not we have no interest as a state to be a majority shareholder, which is a deep change actually in the conception of, uh, of control. So this is a French case and we tried uh, to uh, compare this case with uh, other uh, countries, uh, especially uh, European countries and I will uh, ask Scott to explain you this second part so I hope you will listen to it. Listen so, to it. so Scott. Yeah, sorry. thank you Adrien. So I'll tell you about um, now that you have a, a global view of the French case, I'll give you a much quicker view of uh, three European countries, so it's Italy, Germany, and the UK, um, uh, and try to argue that normalization can be seen as a transnational, transnational process um, that is shared among these four countries, uh, not only France, but also uh, France, Italy, Germany, and, and the UK. So the main idea of the defending is that um, we can, when we look at SOEs, especially European SOEs, uh, we can see it's a common, kind of a common trajectory. Uh, it's not uh, in the literature. Um, there is an argument that um, there's been a return of the investor state um, since the 2008 crisis. And what we argue is that there's been a, um, a kind of re of the, the state as an investor. It's not, it's not a return uh, because there was something before, actually. We do, we, uh, the literature emphasizes uh, privatization processes in the 90s, 80s and 90s, and then in the 2010s and 2020s, kind of a return out of nowhere of the investor state. What we're, we're arguing is that Actually, uh, there was something in between um, these in, in part. It was uh, these normalization processes that were um, kind of transforming SOEs. Um, so these were more gradual transformations than um, sort of on off history. Uh, and what we will be arguing is that um, SOEs have been undergoing a three stages historical process. Um, so with these common three stages, uh, but with specific technologies depending on, on the countries and mainly institutional contexts. So stage one, um, a common delegalization of the SOE organizational form, mainly taking place in the 80s, but in the German case, for example, uh, uh, way before in the 60s um, and even, even, even maybe before. And what kind of consequences did it have? Well, privatization is uh, is one, but also normalization processes that went together with privatization. So some first were privatized uh, for parts. So the states remained as a minority shareholder and the rest of the firm, well, the whole firm was normalized. And some firm were wholly normalized like the SNCF in the railway system in, in France. And some other firms were fully privatized. So these two systems coexisted for, for, for about 20 years. And the second point is that the states, uh, the delegitimization of the SOE went together with the 
delegitimization of the state as a shareholder. So to remain the shareholder of some companies, uh, those that were normalized, it had to undergo a transformation process uh, such as Adrien described for you uh, in the case of the APU in France. So profilization, specialization on uh, on the, the shareholding, um, uh, kind of autonomy from the state uh, administration, central administration, and uh, financialization of, of the of the of the of the protocols. So second stage, these are historical stages that you see have uh, an influence one over the other. The second stage is um, the one that is uh, associated in the literature on the, with the, the 2008 crisis. What you observe when we look at um, specific SOEs and specific sectors is that the 2008 crisis played a role, but it's not the only one. It's not the only crisis, but in in many many in many cases or at, at the level of the the industry or the level of the, com of the company, there's been a weakening or there have been weakenings of companies or bankruptcies that have been framed um, by public officials uh, or the, the public opinion as failures uh, of these privatization or normalization operations. Um, so the, the idea was that privatization or um, normalization operations led to these bankruptcies or weakening of uh, of companies. Uh, when I say weakening, it, it could mean that a company would not be able to uh, to be competitive or would be uh, prone to be to be bought by a. a, a investor from Broad, uh, which is quite important in France and Italy, for example. So weakening of these companies on bankruptcies that led to the stage three, a real legitimization of SOEs that is what is deemed in the literature as a return to the state capitalism. But what we are arguing is that returns, but in different form. Why? Because, uh, well, history matters and uh, things have been going on uh, during these 20, 30 years. The European Commission, by the way of the competition policies, is strongly relating the issue. So you can't nationalize. You have a country that is uh, that goes bankrupt. You can't nationalize it without uh, disinvest its international activities and everything that matters to, to in competitive markets. And uh, so we've got either uh, kind of uh, results of, of SOEs that are either normalized firms or small scale nationalizations, uh, such as uh, I don't know, um, in Germany, for example, um, after the two, 2022 um, energy crisis, the state had to nationalize Uniper um, as a uh, gas operator, an operator on the gas uh, gas markets, and it had to invest all these international activities in, uh, in order to conserve the national uh, the parts operating on on German um, national markets. So these are the general hypotheses that um, <clears throat> kind of um, but what we will see is that. The processes affecting the different countries are specific to each country and tell us about the national features of uh, or their catalyst systems. So in Italy, um, I'll go quickly with uh, if you're interested in in, in the, the three cases, uh, I, uh, you can look at the paper uh, where they describe more in more detail. But in Italy, the SOEs have been historically central uh, when they say histories since the, the 30s, central to Italian capitalism. And there's still there's still a very large public sector. Uh, to give you a figure, it's it's a bit um, it dates from 2016, but it's with a very low point, uh, the historical low uh, point of um, SOEs in Italy. Put one person of at least. 1500 largest companies assets where state property. So it gives you a, a, 
an idea of the, the strength of the states or the role of the states um, shareholdings uh, in Italian capitalism. Italy had very distinct and evolving organizational features. Um, so I'll give you um, a quick overview. Um, at the beginning, it began really with the creation and consolidation of a first um, holding system, the IRI, the 30s. Um, then you had um, kind of formation by shareholding system in the immediate post war period to the early 60s. With the creation of the uh, any which still exists uh, as a um, the Ente Nazionale del Cargo in 1953 and the creation of the Ministry of State Holdings in 1956. Then the system expanded uh, to four super holdings and then it collapsed in the, in the 80s and, and 90s. So just give you uh, some features of the system, which is quite uh, quite uh, specific. The IRI, the first holding, was managed by very few individuals and left a great autonomy in the 50s to sectoral holding companies and even more autonomy to state-owned co companies. Um, so the Christian Democrats in 56 tried to establish the Ministry of State Holdings in order to strengthen political control of the state-owned comp companies. But um, it resulted, it resulted um, to, um, to place at the top of a hierarchy the political parties that were forming the governing club coalition. So they played a central role in uh, the firms, um, the SOE's government. So in a way, the government's increased control of a state-owned enterprises seems to have strengthened the client relationships between individuals, political parties, and managers. So it resulted to what is called in the literature political capitalism in the 70s and 80s. Um, so as more and more capital was devoted to kind of prestige projects, highly publicized, costly, that were more um, interested in gaining um, Popularity um, in Italian regions, particularly in the south, um, in contrast with they did not have um, very interesting economic or social objectives. So it did it did legitimize uh, the state as a shareholder, and it resulted in this in this stage one uh, limited normalization and privatization. So what why limited uh, governance in France? Well, because in Italy, the state is a uh, capital supply to, to large firms, and especially SOEs. So it couldn't, it wasn't able to, to privatize as uh, much as it could, uh, as, it, as it would uh, have liked, uh, because it couldn't find um, uh, stable shareholders to replace uh, the state. Um, at the same time, uh, in the French case, the European Commission uh, played a central role in the normalization of the state um, as a shareholder, uh, because as I told you, the state uh, used to, always does, um, foster uh, firms' um, internationalization. So they're, they're, they're quite aggressive on international markets. They tend to, uh, to buy their, their competitors um, on foreign markets. Whereas Italian firms uh, are more domestic, um, and more domestic oriented, and they're not so aggressive as uh, as French firms. So there was a low pressure by the European Commission to normalize um, the state as a shareholder. It was normalized. Uh, the government of SOEs was centralized, uh, but it was characterized in contrast to France, a weaker specialization, for example, uh, the directorate, uh, the general directorate uh, that is um, uh, specialized on SOEs also deals with concessions. Um, it deals with European funds. Um, so it's not only specialized in, in, in SOEs uh, governments. It provides very little information um, uh, publicly. 
So there was a stage two uh, as well in Italy. Um, so some events uh, that affected um, firms or uh, industries. Uh, so I'll give you one uh, example. Uh, the image you can see um, on the right side of the, the slide is the Morandi Bridge in Genoa, who collapsed in 2018, and it killed 43 people. So received widespread media coverage in Italy and around the world. And actually, this bridge is a section of a motorway, um, the network which was privatized in 1999, um, operated since then by the Benetton family. So uh, the motorway company, or the Strade, was very profitable. And just before the tragedy, it declared a profit of almost, almost 1 billion uh, euros uh, when compared to sales that were 4, billions, uh, 4 billion euros um, in size. So just after the tragedy, the Italian government threatened to, to revoke the concession. And uh, this investigation revealed that the groups ending up the bridge had been poorly managed and that it had prioritized profits of our maintenance uh, expenditures. So uh, it led to the nationalization of um, Italian motorways. Um, so these new nationalization had different features than the, the previous ones. They were, they were thought as temporary um, nationalization that lasted. Um, Why did it last? Well, uh, because the Italian government um, had many difficulties in finding uh, suitable shareholders um, and willing shareholders to to buy uh, to buy the firms uh, and to to to, to enable uh, privatization processes. So, if we go to uh, the UK case, maybe. Adrian, if you could, yeah, thanks. Well, very quickly, in the UK, um, SOEs are different from um, the French and, and, and Italian ones because they've been historically contested as in as an organizational form. Um, the label, the consensus, uh had different ideas about what SOEs could and should do. And even in the label party, um, that when was the main supporter of SOEs, uh, there were differences in opinions um, as to what SOEs were supposed to, to, to do in the economy. Um, as a result, there was a late and less extensive nationalization than in continental Europe that can link to the fact that, uh, well, the UK is mainly islands, so there are less, um, there may be, there may might be a less lesser need to nationalize enterprises um, for sovereignty purposes. Uh, but you can also uh, explain by the fact that um, at the beginning of SOEs in the 30s and 40s, well, the UK was an empire uh, that was built on uh, the idea of the free market that benefited to, to, to the UK. So, uh, and SOEs go a bit against the idea of a free market. Another feature of the of the UK system was that the public sector government was quite close to firms' management, so they were they benefited from a great autonomy compared to in comparison to, to France, uh, for example. So stage one, very quick, um, it went to contested uh, organizational form to completely delegitimize de the eighties uh, through Thatcher government. Um, and privatization were used by Thatcher as a way to uh, the symbol of a determination to um, to change uh, completely change the the system the economy um, uh, of the UK. It was in the context of huge coal worker strikes uh, that also antagonized parts of the electorate and enabled Thatcher to to um, to pursue um, the privatization program. So there was no normalization in comparison to uh, Italy and France, uh, but there was a normalization uh, of the shareholding states as part of larger uh, government reforms uh, 
that went that went quite deep um, in the 90s and 2000s, and that resulted in the government shareholdings, uh, is the administration, what um, plays the role of the administration overseeing uh, the public sector, is a company owned by the state, uh, manned by um, well, people that have um, careers in uh, investment banks, and um, it largely fun largely functions uh, as an investment bank, um, even more so than the, the French APU. Stage two, there has been degradation of our railways and uh, and of the public service in general, um, that led to a campaign in favor of nationalization. Um, and some parts of the railway system have been nationalized. And since the 2020s, um, the British government has been has been nationalizing um, smaller firms um, for sovereignty purposes. So um, mainly companies operating on the British markets um, as a way to manage failures of the market markets, um, as in the example of British Whale, uh, but also as a way to, uh, for example, if you the example of a nuclear plants that have been built by ODF, by the way. And that was partly uh, uh, owned by a Chinese SOE. And in 2020, the British government decided to uh, to buy out uh, the the, uh, the 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 part that belonged to the share, the whole the the part that belonged to the SOE uh, the, the Chinese SOE um, for sovereignty purposes. And so overall contested history contested form um that has been back for some years but they still quite um they still quite um quite uh how should i say it's not it's not a central part of uh of the uk uh capitalism so in germany you've got limited public sector but that is partly due um, to uh, our concentration, our focus on uh, the federal government. Um, so in Germany, the lender and the main cities are major shareholders. Um, uh, so this bottle of beer um, give you the, the example of uh, Brown uh, that is possessed, uh, that is owned by uh, Van der Boer, uh, Land, around Berlin. Uh, has been owned by this this land since 1922. So um, the lender and the Macy's are major shareholders of the German uh, economy. Um, second fact, historical fact, um, the public sector has been associated with World War War reparations. So because the Heisman system, so the public railways were so profitable, French, um, uh, the French after uh, the First World War, uh, used uh, its profits, its dividends, as uh, as a way to um, uh, to repair or to it used the funds uh, from the railway system to um, uh, to reconstruct its economy. So, as a consequence, uh, the German uh, the German state did not uh, nationalize other firms um, in the course, um, at least until World War II. Then the Nazis were the ones, uh, the Nazi government was the one that uh, did a lot of nationalization. So it did not give a good image of, um, of SOEs. More, recent, more recently, uh, the East Germany, um, uh, the, the part of Germany was, was the socialist regime used to have large, uh, large holdings, uh, industrial holdings. So, Overall, um, the public sector was associated to um, to um, to models or to some some parts of the history um, that were not um, were not used as a model for for the national economy. So there was a reference to nationalize that we can find nowadays. 
Uh, second point is that SOEs were closer to private companies as in the UK. They do not have a specific legal status as in France and Italy, and they provide the dividends to their shareholders, um, such so as private firms. Uh, they were delegitimized very early on, uh, so were no nationalization after World War II, and there were, was a gradual privatization process that was um, that underwent um, since the 1960s. Uh, so together with this very early digitalization, the state was very weakly normalized. Uh, there's a weekly uh, special administration in charge of SOEs, with the directorates of the Ministry of Economic Affairs. There's also uh, responsible for Euro coinage, uh, for nuclear plants uh, management, for many things that have nothing to do with SOEs. Um, but after some minor crisis uh, in specific industries, so, such as the 2001 IT market bubble, the 2022 in a crisis, and the growing environment, environmental concern, the state accepted, in, in a way, uh, great reluctance to uh, use state ownership to uh, solve some, some issues. Um, but nationalizations uh, went with major divestment programs, um, mainly of foreign activities um, of uh, the firms that became cities. Um, so great reluctance to, to nationalize, but still uh, real re legitimization, sorry, it's difficult to pronounce, um, uh, of SOEs. So what do these three cases uh, tell us about normalization processes? So there have been normalization of SOEs in France and Italy uh, in two different forms. Uh, so on one side, you have France and Italy. Uh, the normalization of SOEs went together with privatization programs. And these normalized firms um, were also partly, partially privatized and took place in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. On the other side, we've got another kind of uh, normalization in the UK and Germany that took place in the 2010s, 2020s, alongside nationalization programs. And it resulted not in normal companies, but in kind of abnormal companies. Uh, that is why they they had to uh, to keep kind of a local scope, and they couldn't have um, international strategies, expansion strategies. So two different normalization processes. Um, if you look at the states, uh, the association differ. The France and UK on one side with a strong normalization of the states. Um, the state as a shareholder is an agency. It's, it functions on public and private um, features. Um, it's asking for dividend policies. Um, it's, it has got, it enjoys at least uh, publicly uh, a great deal of autonomy. It Scott, went together with a strong pressure Scott. for normalization. Scott, if uh -huh. I may, if you, if we can uh, try to finish in two, three, four minutes. Yeah, it's um, okay. It's coming to an Thank end. you. Presentation. Um, so it went together uh, with a strong pressure for normalization because of the ideology, in the the UK case probably, but because of the pressure uh, of the European Commission, the French case, and. What do France and the UK share uh, in that context? Well, in our opinion, it goes together that strong normalization with the strong links that we can observe between the state and large firms and the prominent role of the administration in both countries. Whereas in Germany, Italy got low normalization of the state as a shareholder. But it could be explained in general terms by, because um, uh, or that distance we can observe between the administration of firms and the weak autonomy of the administration vis-a-vis uh, -vis the political sphere, sphere. So in Germany, Italy, uh, there has been little pressure on um, on 
for normalization uh, because there was the need um, in a way uh, in the European Commission's opinion. So just a word to conclude, is the investor state uh, striking back? So I hope we've shown the relevance of uh, some positions we can find the, in the literature. So that of the regime versus liberalism, that of a strong state versus a weak state. So the state intervenes, uh, uses SOEs as, as instruments of public policies, but in different ways. And so in a way, you've got varieties of, um, of a variety of ways to use SOEs. Um, above all, we've shown that uh, it's a history of continuity and change. Uh, there's no been, there hasn't been um, an end of SOEs uh, followed by a return of the United States out of nowhere. And in a way, state capitalism can be seen as both an illustration and a feature of national varieties of capitalism. Uh, so it leads acting as an institutional investor because of the lack of capital in, in the economy. In France, it's used because of the law of the of the large firms, because large firms as used are used as the kind of main structures of the economy. Uh, it's used as protection from international investors that could harm uh, the system by buying and 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 uh, or cutting into parts uh, the, the the these large firms. And in France, it's also uh, used. Uh, uh, SOEs are also used as a way to foster the growth of firms, especially um, abroad. Um, well, then if you look, if you look, just to conclude, at the USA, uh, it's a way to 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 make a point um, to, to to show you our arguments. Um, the USA uh, is a kind of well, there are virtually no you know, do SOE in the USA. Because they're completely delegitimized, they've, they've never been they've never been enjoying the sort of legitimacy they've been enjoying in continental Europe. But do the USA need SOEs actually uh, to uh, intervene in the economy? Well, if you look at the defense industry, for example, uh, it's it's actually indirectly controlled by government procurement uh, programs. Um, if you look at the boards of the largest firms in the defense industry, they're full of retired generals of the army or, or the air force. Um, so there are other ways uh, the US government, federal government is using to control uh, and to foster the growth of, um, of specific firms. It goes together with the idea that, that the USA has a big, big domestic markets that's largely protected um, from firms from abroad. In comparison with Europe, they have uh, that enjoy smaller markets um, where the well, the idea is mainly to um, to foster the growth of firms. In comparison in the US, in the US, where the, the the issue is more to avoid more basic big business on the national markets. So, as you see, the same issue. Uh, can be um, or can be sold and can be um, with SOEs or all the different yeah. mechanisms uh, that have to do with the, the institutions that are legitimate in a, in a, in a model of capitalism. So I've been quite quick, but um, there's not much time left, but uh, please, if you have questions and comments, we, they're very welcome. Yeah.